Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, my chilly friends. Um, programming note, technical note, uh, the heat was off this morning. The heat is now back on. However, it is a boiler system. If you look to your right and to your left, uh, those are the radiators. The heat starts here and works its way around here. So this one's still cold. That one's real hot. So if you're feeling chilly, A, worship harder. <laughs> B, get coffee, still warm. Uh, and if you're getting real desperate, you can move towards the outsides with a preference towards this side. Uh, and it will be... Closer to the heat, yes, but also closer to the windows, which, depending on which window you're in front of, might feel like an air conditioner. Um, yeah. We'll get there. Maybe just stay where you're at. Or keep your, your coat on, and it'll be fine. But either way, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we're going to worship together. We're going to lift up our Lord. We're going to seek him, uh, his presence. So join us if you will. Feel free to stand. Feel free to move around if you need to. Let's just lift our eyes and our hearts and our minds and our voices to him.
a place for me and I'm a child of God yes I am I'm a child I'm a child of God yes I You may 
the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean so I sing how marvelous shall ever be oh how marvelous oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me when he took my sins and my sorrows he made them his Lord, we thank you for your beautiful love. For your saving grace. For your presence here with us. You're so beautiful. You're so wonderful. Help us to open our eyes to see it. Help us to open our ears to what you're saying to us this morning. Help us to know you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. Welcome to Echo in the first year of 20, first Sunday of 2024. It's, it's already the beginning of the year. Yes. So friends, I have some things to share with you today. First of all, there are eight of you new faces who have arrived at Echo for the first time today. So during this time, we're going to have a chance to say hello to people. And I'm going to say, hey, all you people who come to Echo all the time, find someone who looks brand new and give them lots of love. Now, let me tell you, my name is Kelly Carr. I am the lead pastor here today, and usually the next thing I do is step up on the stage and preach today. But we are a small church with all hands on deck, and we all take turns doing different things. And I haven't hung out with Echo Kids in a while, so I'm gonna be the Echo Kids teacher in the elementary room today. So kids, you can head on back there, and I'll follow you in just a moment. And I'll leave you in good hands, because my, one of my preaching mentors is a leader of Echo Church who happens to be my husband. And he has good things to say today. So give him all your love, and I will be back to see you afterwards. And I will also let you know that we do things beyond Sunday morning. We gather in small groups. So if you'd like to find out about a small group, then come see me after church, or Dylan, he knows the right people to send you to. Dylan, that's Dylan. He's great. And I think that's all. We have uh, um, all kinds of things going on. So just hang out after church today as long as you feel warm. And just make sure that you check in with somebody. If you'd like to pray, I'm going to come out after church, after the service. And I'll be here and I love to hang out and pray with you if you need as well. Because we always want to offer that. So this is our time. I'm going to head out. Y'all are going to say hi to one another. That's what we do here. Welcome. Okay, everybody, that's enough. That's enough. That's just enough. That's enough. Stop. Stop being friendly. No. Garrett, we, all, we advertise this as a friendly church, but it's just marketing for the website. It's what we do. Y'all, it's great to be here. It's great when uh, my wife lets me do stuff, just generally, but then when she's like, hey, I'm giving you the church, don't break it, but, um, if you, and if you're new here, welcome. My name's Steve. Kelly and I started the church with a group of people, boy, this will be year 19 that we're coming up on, which has just been a great journey, but what's funny is, is that even though in the early years I did all the communicating, like when people come, I always have to preface it, because they're like, oh, and what do you do here, Steve? And I'm like, I don't even know anymore, but uh, Eric uh, McDonald's, who's, in, who's back in the uh, kids' room serving back there, and I, we're elders at the church. We have a great staff who um, is able to just do the day-to-day -day and pastor everybody, and we're just glad you're here. This community is a great community that is just the joy of my life, so as we start 2024, I just love to have the chance to be able to um, open up and share, and usually what I do, because my my degrees, my 
my actual um, pieces of paper are all in theology, and I'm a, I'm a trained theologian. So usually, and that's when Kelly was like, oh, Steve's my mentor. She does a lot of stuff that I used to do, which most importantly is we're very much a church that's dedicated to studying the Bible, the Word of God. And we do that just because we're like, look, there's tons of wisdom out there, but for us to get into the scriptures and to try to understand them more and see how they reflect to each other is very important to us as a community. And that's where Kelly just does an admirable job. And she is getting ready next week to start a series on the book of Hebrews from the New Testament. And that's an interesting book because it intertwines some Old Testament Jewish ideals into the life of in person of Jesus and what that means to us. So I think that's going to be a great study. But when she said, hey, I, I, can you fill in and can you do a, a one-off to start the year? And then I'm like, yeah, but I want to do something different. And because she's back in the kids, I can do whatever the hell I want. So we're going to do that today. And I'll lead into it with this is um, my day job. And actually, that's actually why uh, we started the church, but because we did it on such low overhead, I've always had different jobs. And the job that I've held for about eight years is with a firm that's based in Southern California, and they do loans to Christian nonprofits, most, m most directly churches. And it was not that I had a finance background, I had a theology background, but they're like, look, since you're working with churches and church leaders, you understand the rhythms, we can help you learn finance. So now I'm in this weird world that combines understanding uh, logistics on the financial side that also engages with people trying to do work for the kingdom. So it, it's an interesting firm. It, it's peculiar, but one of the things that it does afford me is that once a year I get what we deem a Sabbath day. And that Sabbath day is for me just to take the day. It's like, look, it's your spiritual reset day. You get a day just to go and craft out whatever is going to help you spiritually. And that's a blessing and a benefit to it. But a lot of my engagement with Christianity is very cognitive. Like, I love to read, and I love to study the scriptures and text, and I love to find little snippets because it's in finding those new um, ideas, that inspiration that I never knew through study, that's usually the discipline, and that's how I engage with God, right? I do it on a very cognitive level. So my prayer life is pretty sucky. Like, I pray, but I don't do it well. But boy, when I'm learning new things about the scriptures and the way of God, that's where I'm like in my, I'm just right in my groove. So what I decided to do this year was like, I need just to do something that works against how I perform spiritually, right? We have to get outside of our experiences to get there. So what I decided to do was I went and spent my day at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And I'm hoping some of you have been there. If you've never been to the Art Museum, number one, it's free. They like, you know, to get into some of the exhibits, the special exhibits, it costs a little bit, but there's no better venue in the city. It's, for, for a smaller city art museum, I feel it punches above its weight class. Susan, who's part of our church, um, works there. Um, I always say she's a docent, but I forget what it is. It's not like an official docent because she corrected me. But basically, she's one of those that says, no, you can't, like, lick the art, which... If you've ever been to the art museum, by the way, her best story ever is, is that there's like a old historic bed there and some dude just hopped in the bed. It's like, and she's like, sir, you can't be in the bed. Like, it's not try out art. Like the art was not your nap. But I like the art museum because it has different pieces. And specifically, it has a painting by Vincent van Gogh. And I'm not, an, uh, like, so just to be clear, because some of you all I, I, are, are far more intelligent than I am when it comes to art. Like, I know this much, right? There's the, uh, like, I know Monet and Monet are different than Kanye. Like, it's just, they're... There are art aspects that I don't understand, but I know Van Gogh. Actually, this painting, I, I, I couldn't find it in my files because this is a copy, but Kelly and I saw this painting with Caitlin when we were in Paris years ago, um, and I think it's in, the, it's in the Orsay. It's it's not in the Louvre, but it's just Van Gogh I've always found interesting, and part of that is because I actually, when I taught in in seminary, and Rob, I think you were in this a class where I used this, there's this book called The Divine Commodity, because I was like, how long ago was that? And it was 2009 when that was published, so you get to feel old this morning, friend. So 
uh, which is not that old, but for a book to have resonance. The reason I like this book, Divine Com Commodity, and a Chicago-based uh, church leader, theologian named Sky Jathani wrote this book. And what I liked about it is that really it's a book about our modern tendencies, right? Our, the commodity, how we are consumers, but it did it juxtaposed against the life of Vincent Van Gogh. And again, I'm not into art, so it was a good discipline for me to be able to find out more about Van Gogh. And that's what's interesting is that the art museum itself opened, I think it's 1881 when it opened, and Van Gogh passes away in 1890, right? So it's like, even at that point, even though he was making art, the idea that he would have a painting in this institution, you know, over 100 years later is interesting. About Van Gogh, a few facts that I think are helpful. Number one, he grew up in a very religious family. And for some of us in this room, we resonate with that. And you might resonate even more with this, because his father was a minister at the time. He's a Calvinist minister. And at the same time, even though he was intrigued by faith, he always continued to struggle it, with it. So in the early years of his life, as he was figuring out what he wanted to do as a career, he actually investigated the idea of becoming a minister himself. He actually interned at a Methodist church underneath a pastor. He really immersed himself into trying to figure out more about how God was working through his life. He studied scriptures deeply. He, he actually tried to learn the original uh, languages of the text, the Hebrew and the Greek, and not only that... Um, he, he went on a few missions. Uh, Sky Jathani in this book, this is what he says to introduce that idea to us. So I think I have the quote. Vincent Van Gogh is remembered for his volatile mental health, severing his ear and later taking his life. But the tortured artist had a volatile relationship with Christianity, oscillating between devotion and rejection. At one time, his fervor was so intense he became a missionary but his struggle was primarily with the institutional church, not Christ. In his final years, as his mental illness became more severe, Van Gogh reveals a profound devotion to Jesus while remaining disillusioned with the church. And one of the reasons that resonated to me, and actually this is one of the reasons that Kelly and I, when we felt moved to leave our suburban abode to come and move into the city, one of the rhythms was is that we felt that that pool that Van Gogh felt is a prevalent pull that continues to happen today, which is that there are people who are church adjacent. Maybe they were born there. Maybe they had good rhythms of it. But it's the more that we learn and the more that we see, we become disillusioned. And because our disillusionment becomes so great, sometimes we want to throw the baby out with the bath water and say, faith is not for me. And that's painful because there are places where it can exist and it doesn't have to run parallel with what we see on a media side, what we see on the internet with a popular move, a popular way of understanding what Christianity is. There's space for this to exist. But unfortunately, in the late 19th century, Van Gogh struggled to find that. Now, he was still able to channel much of his spirituality into his art, and that's what we have today. And that's why, if you can, you know, bear with me, Dylan, I have a bunch of slides because the first one is Starry Night, and I'm not even going to lie, once we get past this, I have no idea what the names of these paintings are. I just, what happened is I went onto Google, I copied, pasted, and put it in a slide deck. Go ahead and scroll through. What's interesting is, is that some of these, whether it be landscapes, you know that he does floral work, so he was very entranced with flowers. As you look through some of the paintings, the one coming up in a few slides, and you can go ahead and take the time uh, as you're pushing through it, but there's the one of the Paris streetscape, and Kelly and I were actually talking about this pa painting before she knew I was talking about Van Gogh, but this one right here, and she's like, you know, that one painting, like, what's the name of that? And I was like, I swear it's like cafe chairs or something like that. It was like, brilliant. I don't know about you, but even just looking at paintings, it makes me feel like I've emerged into a higher version of myself. It's like I'm just the wiser. 
I looked at the paintings. So that's what I thought I would do. I would go to the art museum, surrounded by paintings. But I wanted to find the Van Gogh because I had the, the, the book of Jothani, and I'm like, I can read about Van Gogh's life, and I'm just going to sit in the midst of that. So grabbed my backpack. I walked over to the museum. And I get to the second floor, and actually, I know where this painting is. I don't know if you've ever been up there. You have to go to the second floor, which always getting up there is weird because if you don't take the right route, you have to walk through every other painting. And I, I don't know, at the top of the spiral staircase or whatever, you go left and left. Don't go to the first left because you'll see Andy Warhol's Pete Rose, which is the best painting that has ever been painted. Nobody's subscribing. That's fine. You go left and left and right. And in the second room there, there's the Van Gogh painting. I make the beeline there and I look and the painting is not there. And I'm like, that's peculiar. And by the way, it's this painting and the, the title of it and you know, Kelly's better at this with her laptop. <clears throat> my iPad keeps locking up right here because it doesn't want you to steal my information. This painting is called, um, you see it's so bad I can't even remember, right? Undergrowth with Two Figures. And by the way, so I knew this painting was there and I was like, you know what, it, to be in a room to stare at this painting, I feel like it would be interesting because, it, and by the way, if you can hit the next slide, you can see there's the two figures if you can't see it because it's on a screen way up here, but I'm like, you know, to be in the room, to be able to take this in, to have to sit in the silence in my brain to try to read and figure this out of Van Gogh, I was like, this will be a transformative experience. I get to where the painting is, it's not there. So I find one of the employees who's working in the next room to make sure I don't lick the paintings, and I say, hey, isn't the Van Gogh usually right there? And she looks, she goes, sir, I'm sorry, it's actually on loan. She, so I, I was like kind of devastated because it's like I had this whole game plan. But she said, but don't worry, we actually have a Van Gogh on loan from Paris that you can see. And I'm like, ooh, Paris, like this is going to be great. And she takes me over to an adjacent room and she shows me this picture. L'Italien, anyone? My French is bad too. So I don't know art and I don't know French, but that's fine. But basically it's the Italian lady I think is the, the translation, uh, painted in 1887. So, by the way, go back, will you just go back to the other slide? The, the reason I found this interesting too is that Van Gogh paints the, uh, the undergrowth with two figures in, I wanna say it was like June of 1890, and the next month after painting this painting, he takes his own life, right? So I'm like, there's something about that. So I'm like, I'm gonna have this transformative experience, and then, they're like, hey, here's the picture that we have on display. And I'm looking at some chick who looks as plain as day, just like, and I don't know if you can see from that, and you could probably Google that if you want to get a better picture of it, but it's like she is the most unpleasant person, <laughs> is unhappy to be there. And I'm like, great, now I've got this whole plan, and I'm going to have to spend the hours looking into this lady's eyes who's staring right back to me. It was not what I thought would be fun. Okay. Here's the thing, though. So I'm like, I've got, I pull up my phone. I'm like, who is this lady? I do some research. Her name is Angostina Sagatori. And by the way, you can tell of her descent, she's Italian, hence La Italiana. That's her background. She was uh, from Italy and immigrated to Paris. And when she was there, she actually started a cafe and this cafe became very popular among different other artists, including uh, Van Gogh. And while she was there, she, you know, she sold some coffee and some liquor. And then she also really hooked up with a bunch of painters. Like, that was her, <laughs> this was her gig. So I'm like, I am going to have a spiritual experience, as I understand. La Italian. I'm just saying that for my own pleasure right there. That's fun. Um... So I Google about this painting. I'm like, is there any significance about this painting? Uh, the quote I found from one art historian, art critic, said that, um, oh, no, this was it, and I'm trying to find my notes right here. This is actually uh, a, a quote from Van Gogh that he told his friend about this painting. And he said, my idea was to be able to express the terrible passions of humanity by means of red and green. And I love that his description of L'Italian, who we know he had a more carnal relationship with, was the terrible passions. Like, that is, you know, if that's a Tinder bio, if I've ever seen one, right? It's that she did not have anything going for her. By the way, 
Vincent did another painting of her too, and I think we've got this one. And I don't know if either one of them, it's very interesting because that, I mean, that's that thing, the outgrowth above her head is actually supposed to be her hair, which I don't know how that actually worked scientifically back in the day because I think they did not have nearly as much hair product. I do like, if you can see in this one, she's got a cig and a, a thing of beer right too. So maybe this was the source of the terrible passions that she had. More interesting too, she modeled with, for other painters beyond Van Gogh. Uh, the paintings here, uh, Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot, which I know he's a painter and that's just it. Some of you might know one of his works, but Edouard Monet, actually both of them had relationships with her as well. Monet's the one on the right and I feel like he's the one who actually, you know, encapsulates that like Bastille-esque like French independence for the Italian lady. Like, she looks fierce right there. You know, I don't know what happened with Jean-Baptiste because every pose this lady has is just like, I hate you painters. And I was going to do like some French. I was like, oh, I hate you painters, but she was Italian and my Italian accent is not working. It will be a, a, a racial incident. So we will not get to that. Okay, pause from this. So I'm grappling with, what do I figure out uh, right here about all of this, right? Um, Vincent uh, once said, I'm going to pivot back to the painter right here. Um, Vincent once said, when I have a need of religion, I go out and paint the stars. So he had this aspect of what he was doing through art was part of his spiritual discipline. It was a way that he was able to encounter the divine. So he did this, and I want to show you another painting. I have not seen this, but this is uh, one that I find fascinating. This, this painting here is called Still Life in the Bible. And what's interesting about this one, and by the way, there's not a lot of Bible verses within this message. I've got one coming up. Hold on for that. But at least I showed a picture of the Bible, which just shows my dedication to it. Still Life in the Bible by Van Gogh. Um, this is actually a painting of his father's Bible. So he grabbed his minister father's Bible and painted it. And by the way, the, the, there's a little book right there. And you're like, what's the little book around? And the little book, it, you can't see it here on the screen, but it, it says, it, it's a book entitled The Joy of Life. <laughs> okay, so it's very interesting, though, because you're like, oh, is he trying to make a statement of the joy that scriptures be, bring to us? But if one thing is just know the color of this painting. It's drab. And actually, one of the most interesting things, if you can see to the right side of the Bible, that's a candle. And candles are used, especially in this pre-electric day, for illumination, to be able to see, to be able to read and encounter it. And yet, this candle is extinguished. And it's hard to look at this. So, you're just like, hey, but the joy of life is right there. Yes, but everything is extinguished and drab. And what he's juxtaposing here is this idea that this book does not bring joy to me. That his view of spirituality and the religion that he knows is actually something that has been extinguished in his life. So he paints this at a young age. I think it's at the, uh, in the age of his 20s. And still having yet to figure out if he wanted to pursue art or what he needed to do, he just goes on a journey at the age of 26. Um, he moves to Belgium. And he is living along uh, the side of miners in Belgium. And he'll do some shifts in the mine in order to get some manual labor in. But he really figures he's not made out for manual labor. But he really just sits in that community. And the most interesting thing is that he engages in a relative 10-month period of silence. So we don't know much about what was going on in his life when he's living in Belgium along these miners. But he then writes later a letter to his brother Theo, and if you know, you know, if Theo of Theodore, it's, you know, Latin for God, so you can see how his father was just really trying, he's got one brother who is actually God, right? And then he's in this place of not understanding who he is. In the midst of this, after being silent, Vincent writes this to his brother Theo. He writes, on the road that I'm on, I must continue. If I do nothing, if I don't study, if I don't keep trying, then I'm lost, then woe betide me. 
That's how I see this, to, to keep on. Keep on. That's what's needed. But what's your ultimate goal, you'll say? That goal will become clearer, will take shape slowly and surely as the crocus becomes a sketch and a sketch becomes a painting. So really it's after this point where he kind of, you know, convents himself, right? To where he's finally trying to figure out, okay, if this is the road I am at, if this is where God the creator is and this is where I'm at, all I know is that I need to keep going and I just need to figure out what I need to do. But I feel that that type of illumination, Dylan, will you just go back to the picture of the Bible right there? Because I feel like this painting really typifies some of the struggle that Vincent had with his religious upbringing with his father as he saw this faith as being dead, as something that was not vibrant in his life. And then he's like, you know what, maybe I just need to stop, see where I'm at. And then finally he tells his brother, I've got to keep on going. Sky Jothani in the book, when recanting this incident, writes this about... Um, basically a, a, a takeaway of what Vincent learned and maybe we ought to learn too. Silence is the beginning of all worship. If imitation is the highest form of flattery, then Christians have become pop culture's most devoted admirers. Jesus says God isn't like a gumball machine. He's more like the wind, unpredictable, uncontrollable, no more containable, than wind in a bottle. Now, this isn't actually my main point, but can I pause and sit in this for a minute? Because as we start the new year, I don't know about you, like the, the big blocking and tackling for me is like getting everything set up. I need to figure out when I'm traveling this year, I want to get my personal you know, schedule and organizer all set up, my email cleared out as well as possible. I'm trying to block and tackle, and everything usually about the new year is movement and pushing, and maybe if you've set some hardcore resolutions, you've been trying to, for the past six days, interact those in your daily lives. Movement becomes such a major part of it, but sometimes we need to actually script within our rhythms those moments to stop, to Sabbath, to be silent, that in the painful science, silence, we hear things about ourselves. It forces us to be alone with our thoughts, and yes, for some of us, that's maybe the most dangerous thing that we do in our lives, but perhaps in this new year, a discipline that you can employ is that of silence. All right, back to the, the painting of the Italian chick. Did you like that transition, Kendra? That was very abrupt. I did it. It was traumatic. I, I actually, I was like, what should I do? Should I just like leave a long silence? Because that would have been more poetic, but that's not me anyways. So I just like, I'm going to be abrupt. Like this is like, nobody is putting this on YouTube. Well, except for like we're streaming it, but you got it. Okay. We're looking at this lady. She's looking back at me. I'm trying to figure out, okay, if I'm going to be an artist, if I'm going to see the rhythms that God maybe has for me to learn, what about this can I see? It's very interesting if, you know, remember the, the, the picture that Jean-Baptiste painted where it's like she had a cig and a beer at her side. Here, all we have are two simple flowers. And if we look at those flowers, and Van Gogh painted flowers quite regularly, but these are about the most dead, <laughs> like they, they, they have something, but they are almost a quasi lifeless view. Now, as much as I'm like, he could have done a better job painting the flowers, maybe that was part of it is that there's some aspect about, you know, he wanted to convey the terrible passions within it, but at the same time, those flowers look like they're struggling to survive. And maybe that is exactly, exactly what Agnostina and Vincent were experiencing at the same time as a struggle. So she had these flowers, which typically we love flowers because they convey life and color and beauty. But in this form, maybe it was just a reminder of the inevitability of our own personal demise. Maybe he was just at this point to where he was just contemplating as he as struggled with his mental illness what he was really about. And it was a low time for him. I don't know. But I look at the flowers, and it's just an important reminder, a lesson for you and I to understand th the fleeting life that we live is something that we always should be reminded of. 
That's the sad thing about flowers, right? Why are they so beautiful? Because they, they had roots, and they grew, and they were connected to the soil, and they had life. But once we put them on display, once we cut them and put them in a vase, then there's an inevit inevitability that those flowers will one day wilt, and they will be no more. And again, that, that idea, you know, it's like, hey, how about a new year wait and huddle? It's great when there's no heat on, too, because you're like, I'm still a little cold, and now that just got really depressing. However, however, one of the reasons that we align ourselves to the teachings of Jesus is because we see that they provide hope for us. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, Jesus testifies, if God cares so wonderly, uh, wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. I'm not going to lie. I was trying to find some meaning out of this painting, and those weird limp flowers that the lady was holding actually helped for me to reframe what I needed to see. Because we look at art to be inspired. And very often, we want inspiration to come from those around us as well. And I'm not going to lie, the Italian chick did nothing for me. I'm like, why do I care what a bar owner from 150 or so years ago did to get this painting that I'm staring at in a museum of works of arts, of art, right? Like, what does that do for me? And the flowers did it, the lifelessness there, but really also, and is it, you'll have to look. I don't know if they finally got the undergrowth picture back, but if you look online, the one thing that we do lose in the pixelation is the vibrancy of the color that Van Gogh did choose for this painting. These reds, these oranges and everything, this is very staid. There's color here, but it's not as vibrant. If you look at the picture of the Italian lady, there was actually some vibrancy there. It was color. And by the way, compared to the other pictures, and can you show those pictures that we showed earlier, Dylan, of all the other paintings? Maybe there was something about Agostina that she just was maybe, it's like apparently she could be passionate, but if all the other artists, do you see how drab all of them are? Maybe there was just some demons in the life that she was fighting and Vincent's like, look, I see this person for something more so than just this, I don't know, she, she just always looks a little judgmental, angry, right? Maybe she just, maybe she's had a hard life. She left her home in Italy to come to Paris, and at that point in the late 19th century, you know, it's not like Paris was all the beautiful city of love that it is today, where, you know, we actually have less cholera or anything. Maybe she was just drab in many aspects of her life. And Vincent wanted to say, look, this is a person who does have some vibrancy, and I'm going to express that in these hues of orange and red and yellow. Maybe what he wanted us to see is how things look without color. Can, do I have the slide there, Dylan? I think I do. I have one where it's just like, but you, you look at the painting, take the color out of it, and it becomes just really, you know, as depressing as it is without the color, it becomes even more so, right? And I should say this, which I didn't even put this in my notes, but I know that, you know, there's a percentage of men more predominantly who are colorblind. If you are, I apologize if I've been, uh, <laughs> if I ascribed you out of this whole thing. You're just like, I have no idea what we're talking about. But I'm going to end with an illustration on color. If some of you colorblind guys are just like, I feel seen, I see you, I'm sorry. Um, color's important. It illuminates, Right? Vincent himself observed, I'm always in hope of making a discovery to express the love of two lovers by a marriage of two complementary colors. They're mingling in their opposition, their mysterious vibrance of kindred tones to express the thought of a brow by the radiance of a light tone against a somber background to express hope by some distant star, the eagerness of a soul by a sunset radiance. All right, so my point of self-discovery is what I wanted to share with you guys today, and I'm hoping this helps you as you go through the new year. Um, really, the lesson that I, I took out of this day staring at this, this lady in the museum, the more I thought about it, is my introspective reality is that 
and you guys know this, I'm a jerk sometimes. But one of the reasons that I'm a jerk is just that I have a high justice quotient. And I like that to be applied well. I want justice in this world because I think our God is a God of justice. And because he's a God of justice, you know, I do that. So, I, so in order to do that, I come up with examples. Actually, it's something that we do. This isn't a biblical concept. This is a psychological concept called heuristics. And what heuristics are is how you and I make assumptions about things so that from an evolutionary perspective, we would say we make assumptions about things to save brain cells and help us to survive. But it's this idea that we are able, we, we develop a worldview, we see the world in such a way so that if I can see it in certain tones, then I can react well and I can apply that. So when I look at me and I think about my justice, I have a high justice value. I want to see that expressed well because, because I want that enacted and I want God's kingdom to reign supreme, right? So when I see things, I judge things. And I judge them because I'm like, that's easy. And I do that a lot with people too. And I'm going to assume that I'm not the only one who is guilty of said sins, right? Like, we judge people. Even though we like to think we're enlightened and stuff, we don't, y'all. It makes us easy to get angry at other people because of their narrow-mindedness, because of how we ascribe their views that are outside of our own. We do that because it's what we see as part of our life, okay? And I, I'll admit it, that's, that was my going into the Italian lady as I was just like, I just see this person I don't admire. What does this have to say to me? I never met this woman. I don't know what she has. And then somehow there were some of the world's greatest artists were inspired by her in such a way that they made paintings of her that still exist to this day. And I just thank God that we serve a God who doesn't judge us by the lowest common denominator, who doesn't employ a heuristic, who understands that all people are his people and that his desire for them to come to understanding of his way is the most important thing. Jathani reminds us towards this, and this is why my takeaway is people, but contemplation and silence. Until I think I have that quote up there, maybe I don't, but he writes, when our imagination are jolted into contemplating our true significance, either by a star-filled sky or some encounter with the transcendent, our response is always the same. Our response is silence. So as we enter into 2024, don't lose your all, A-W-E. Don't lose your appreciation that you know there's something bigger than all of this, right? The world might not make sense. And yes, there will be the hypocritical religious always among us, but do not let them control your view of what God means to you and how God transforms your very life. And that's why when we gather, friends, this is why we do what we do. We just do it because we are a community that is flawed, but man, we're just trying to all go together to the throne of God. That's why I love that at the end of our service all the time, we have a, every week, we have a time of communion. And we use communion as a time to remember the sacrifice, what we believe to be the greatest sacrifice on earth, is Jesus giving life for all humanity. That through his death, we experience life in a way that is unimaginable. So we're going to have a time. Dylan's going to come up, and he's going to play uh, some chords in the background. We're going to have this moment of silence and contemplation to where we can just remember who we are, who God is, and understand that the definition of who we are comes through life in vibrancy of color through him, all right? So we'll have a time of communion. If you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you to come forward, grab the bread and the cup. If you don't feel comfortable coming up, there's no pressure or anything to do this. Like I said, this is for us to have a moment of remembrance and silence.
the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Well, thank you guys again so much for joining us. Um, I promise it'll be warmer next week. Maybe I shouldn't promise that. There's a good chance it'll be warmer next week. Um, in a completely unrelated note, if you need to continue in worship through giving, the, the box is in the back. You can do that allowed. <laughs> This is a complete joke. We were joking about that during worship practice. Um, <coughs> anyways, uh, if you need to do that, there are many ways to do it. Uh, you can sign up for the email list. Uh, you can do all of those things. If you have questions about small groups or anything going on, find me uh, or someone who was on stage, and they'll probably tell you to come find me. Um, one way or another, thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. Have a great week. And we'll see you next week.